時を止まれ So, the new season of Jujutsu Kaisen has started, and in this series, I'm going to be analyzing the story of the series as it airs and, as a manga reader, comparing the anime to the manga to see what they adapted directly, what they modified or expanded, and what they just straight up removed. So, let's begin with the second episode of Season 2 of Jujutsu Kaisen. First, I'll recap the plot and explain what chapters it covered. We pick up just after where we left off. Geto has Kokun restrained with a curse, while he struggles fruitlessly and tries to beg his way out of the situation. He gets angry when Geto pretends not to hear him and claims that Bayer, Q's strongest soldier, will take them down. Geto shows him a picture on his phone and asks if Bayer is in it. The picture shows Gojo standing over a defeated and somewhat bloodied Bayer with a triumphant grin. With this, Q not only has lost its strongest soldier, but quickly disbands. From here, we cut to a racetrack where the suited man from the end of the previous episode approaches Fushiguro as he was apparently looking for him and asks him why he's there. Fushiguro claims he's making money, to which the suited man replies that he's never seen him win, then follows up with a question about work. Fushiguro, irritated, complains that the suited man treats him like a jobless bum, while the suited man insists that he is indeed jobless, but regardless, as a mediator, he has to give the client progress reports. Fushiguro explains that since the girl is under the protection of the golden boy of the Gojo family, he can't just nonchalantly walk in, so he's using those idiots, as he calls them, to wear him down first. He also adds that it appears the suited man isn't working either. The suited man insists he has been, and asks what Fushiguro thinks he's doing wasting all the money he was given. Fushiguro says that's what he means by wear down, and tells the suited man not to worry. They'll see a return on their investment, just like with the race he's bet on. The results of the race are called out, and Fushiguro keeps quiet. The suited man assumes he must have lost, and as he gets up to leave, tells Fushiguro that going for a quick buck doesn't suit him. He says he's counting on him, and calls him the Sorcerer Killer. As he's leaving, he turns back to ask about Megumi, confirming that this Fushiguro is indeed Megumi's father. However, Fushiguro responds with ignorance, asking who Megumi is. Next, we cut back to Gojo and Geto. They ask if they should take the Star Plasma vessel to a doctor, with Geto wishing Shoko was present to administer aid. The Star Plasma vessel awakes, and we learn she has a name, Riko Amanai. She quickly reacts and slaps Gojo in the face, distancing herself from him. Geto explains that they aren't there to abduct her, which she doesn't believe and calls him a liar, while also adding a comment about his hair. Gojo and Geto punish her for her insolence when a new character steps in. Misato Kuroi is Riko's caretaker, and she comes into view writing a curse. She tells Riko that Gojo and Geto are their friends. Riko asks what she's writing, and Kuroi explains that it's the Bangs guy's curse technique, and Geto interjects with disapproval of the nickname. Geto explains his technique, and Gojo is surprised by her spunkiness. He states that he assumed she'd be all sad because of the merger and was proactively worried about her. She claims that he's a simpleton, as evidenced by him making such a simple comment, and explains that she considers herself and Tengen-sama to be one. She assumes he speaks of the merger and death as if they are the same thing, but this is incorrect. She gives an explanation about how who she is will still persist after the merger, but quickly loses the boy's attention, who are more interested talking about the new model Gojo set as his phone wallpaper. Gojo assumes she must not have many friends at school given how she speaks, and Geto speculates that her classmates probably won't have any issues saying goodbye. Riko insists that she speaks fine at school, but suddenly realizes something whilst speaking on the topic, which Kuroi also reacts to. It's obvious that Riko is concerned about school and being late for it, while Kuroi tries to tell her that maybe school isn't really that important right now, but Riko insists on going. We cut to her school, while Gojo has a phone call with Masamichi. Gojo is flabbergasted that they're going to allow her to go to school when the mission is just to get her back to Jujutsu High. But Masamichi explains that Tengen-sama insists that they abide by Riko's demands. Gojo is frustrated at this, but Geto admonishes him. Geto explains that once she merges with Tengen-sama, all of her friends, family, and anyone or anything else she holds dear will be lost to her, so letting her enjoy herself one last time is also part of their mission. Kuroi chimes in and explains that Riko does not have any living family left due to an accident when she was younger. 
and implores the two to at least let her spend time with her friends. Geto, however, says that basically Kuroi is her family now, which makes Kuroi visibly emotional, but she does agree. Gojo asks Geto if there's anything new from the surveillance spirits he has set up around the campus. Geto wishes he shared their vision the way Mei does with her crows, but insists that if anything were to happen, then they would let him know. Just as he says that, he tells Gojo they have to get Tariko ASAP, as two of his spirits have already been exercised. And we see her bounty listed on a website, with Fushiguro licking his lips in anticipation. Back at the school, Gojo, Geto, and Kuroi are hot-footing at Tariko. Gojo asks where she is, and Kuroi says that currently she'd be in her music class, so either the music room or the chapel. Gojo is confused at the presence of a chapel at the school, and Kuroi says that it depends on the teacher, and there's a chapel since it's a missionary school. Geto tells Gojo to take the chapel, sends Kuroi to the music room, and says that he'll take care of the two intruders. Gojo voices his frustration at the girl telling them to keep their distance, and Kuroi apologizes, saying that she even asked her to keep them updated with texts, as Gojo remembers her telling them to stay away to avoid having to explain their presence to her friends. We cut to Fushiguro on the phone, enjoying some takoyaki. He confirms with the suited man that his targets still haven't returned to Jujutsu Hai yet, which he says is good because that means more than just total idiots will be going after the bounty he posted. The suited man asks if he's sure this is a good plan, since the 30 million yen the Time Vessel Association paid him was a service fee, and that if one of the people who go after the bounty he posted managed to pull it off, then he may be left with nothing. Fushiguro explains, stating that Gojo is the first to have both the Six Eyes and the Limitless Technique together in hundreds of years, meaning as long as he's with Riko, no one will be able to touch her, maybe even including himself. So, he'll use the full 47 hours left on the bounty to wear Gojo and any other sorcerers with him down, and since they'll be unable to kill Riko, it'll be free labor. The suited man says it was a good idea to impose a time limit, since it would attract more sorcerers, but Fushiguro states things are moving faster than he expected, and he'd be moving in himself soon. He tells the suited man to have the 30 million yen ready, and when the suited man protests, Fushiguro drops the phone and pretends the line was dropped. Geto wonders if the intruders are remnants of Q, or if it's hired muscle from the Time Vessel Association, which would be more of a problem. At that moment, Geto stumbles across one of the intruders, an older man who mentions Geto's uniform while summoning Shikigami. Geto notices that he assumed the presence of multiple opponents just from his uniform, and covered both his front and behind him with his Shikigami, which means this old man knows what he's doing. The old man takes note of Geto's cursed energy and his lack of intermediary to deduce that his cursed technique is curse manipulation. Geto compliments him on this correct deduction. His wisdom is as his age would suggest. The old man tells him that old age isn't that great. It's very expensive to live that long. As he does so, he thinks about how Geto is acting like a Shikigami user even though his technique is greater, and that, as a youngin, he's easy to predict. He reads Geto's body language and assumes he's uncomfortable with CQC and that he probably doesn't expect an aged curse user like himself to willingly close the distance. Geto points out that he noticed his opponent thinking things through, and summons the cursed spirit he used to capture the curse back at the house when they were saving Utahime. The size of this spirit takes up the whole hallway. As Geto seems to have won, the man breaks through a window from outside behind Geto with a knife, telling him you should never create your own blind spots. Suddenly, the old man is remembering his old dog, Tasuke. Tasuke was his only friend when he was younger, as his parents shunned him for being able to see cursed spirits, and doted on his younger brother instead. He snaps back to the reality, and realizes that his life is flashing before his eyes as Geto beats the devil out of him. As it turns out, Geto had a read on him as well, but the difference was that Geto was bluffing to manipulate the man, which he states is easy to do when your opponent is fixated on a single path to victory. With the fight out of the way, Geto proceeds to the interrogation phase of the encounter. Gojo and Kuroi are still closing in on Riko, who it turns out is in the chapel. Gojo busts into the chapel, calling out Tariko. All the girls in the chapel freak out and begin fawning over Gojo and his good looks, even the teacher. She uses her position to approach him, claiming that this is highly inappropriate even for a family member, but tries to secretly slip him her number while she's at it. This causes a further commotion with the younger girls, starting a bit of an argument between them and the teacher, who makes a reference to Hikaru Genji which I will explain in the analysis section of the video. Gojo uses the distraction to steal off with Horiko out a window, while using his limitless technique to make her weightless so he can carry her like a grocery bag. While she tries to give him a tongue lashing for making himself known, 
He tells her that curse users have attacked, and he's sure she doesn't want to get her friends involved in the violence, so they're going to go to Jujutsu High right away. As Gojo leaps up onto a roof and continues escaping, the bag-masked man notices him and mulls over if she's the 30 million yen bounty, and whether the guy making off with her is another person after the bounty or her bodyguard. As he does so, Kuroi appears behind him and asks if he's with the Time Vessel Association, since he's not wearing the strange uniform of a Q member. He admonishes her for speaking before attacking, takes a swing at her, and she deflects his blow to the side of her head while using her mop like a pendulum against his arm to score a hit on his weak point for massive damage. As she threatens the collapsed man, Ghetto is surprised at her combat ability. She tells him Riko left with Gojo, and Ghetto says they should catch up with them ASAP since things are getting hairy. The bag masked man suddenly dissolves, but laughs since they confirmed for him that the girl he saw being carried away was indeed the 30 million yen bounty. Kudoi asks if he was a Shikigami, but Ghetto confirms he wasn't. He calls Gojo and tells him that Riko has a 30 million yen bounty on her head from a site on the dark web for curse users, which lasts until 11 a.m. two days from then. Gojo hangs up and we see him on the roofs of a neighborhood, with several of the bag masked men confronting him. He claims that they'd welcome the men with open arms at Jujutsu High, considering they're always short staffed. The man declines, thinking the profession is too risky as Riko notices that another has just appeared. Gojo uses his curse technique Amplification Blue to pull two of the bag masked men into each other head first, much to the astonishment of the remaining ones. Riko mentions that the Shikigami aren't disappearing despite having been defeated, wondering which one is the real one. Gojo explains that they aren't Shikigami, but clones, and they're all real. Two of the clones attempt to punch him, but he stops them with infinity. When they ask what's going on, he likens it to the paradox of Achilles and the tortoise, which I'll get into in the second half of the video. The clones obviously don't know what he's talking about, and he reminds them of the importance of studying before taking both of them out with infinity-enhanced strikes. Gojo postulates that his cloning technique maxes out at five clones, and he can change the real body he's inhabiting at will, allowing him to avoid danger by jumping bodies at the last second. He states the man has an interesting technique but wonders why he's so weak despite that. He notices that the man can't create new bodies immediately after old ones are destroyed, and the bag-masked man asks how Gojo knows his technique. Revealing his six eyes to the man, he claims he just has good eyes. Gojo then discloses his technique to the man to empower it, showing how he can make his glasses hover by using infinity to stop them from reaching his hand. He explains that blue is the amplification of his technique, allowing impossible things like natural negative numbers or negative one apples to come into reality. He explains that it's a difficult technique to use, that he can't create a field of attraction too close to himself, and that the precise manipulation of energy tires him out quickly. He pulls the bag masked man in close with his technique, stating that this is all just standard stuff for him. He attempts to use curse technique reversal red, but fails to pull it off and uppercuts the man instead. As he complains that he thought it would really work this time, Riko receives a text that causes her to panic, as it's a picture of Kuroi, who has been captured and tied up. So, with the recap out of the way, let's do a little analysis and look over some info from the manga. So, the important info we walk away from this episode with is as follows. 1. Gato and Gojo initially are to let Riko have some fun in her final days as a free person on Earth, and so allow her to go to school. 2. Fushiguro, the man who took the assassination contract on Noriko, put out his own timed bounty on her to send in riffraff he is confident are unable to defeat Gojo to wear him and his friends down. 3. This causes people going after the bounty to attack Noriko at school, causing Gojo to take off with her for her protection. And 4. While Gojo and Geto defeat the two men who initially go after Noriko, Kuroi is captured and the kidnapper texts a picture of her to Noriko. Here we learn a little about the Star Plasma Vessel, Riko Amanai, as a person. She seems quite upbeat and isn't easily depressed. She is in the care of a caretaker who is practically family to her, Misato Kuroi, since the rest of her family passed away in an accident when she was four. In the pages between these chapters and the manga, we're given some additional info about these two characters that didn't make it into the story. On Riko's page, we learn that she's probably a second year in junior high, which in Japan would mean she's about 13 as in Japan they have three years of junior high or middle school from the ages of 12 to 14, and then three years of high school from the ages of 15 to 17. This would mean it's been not quite 10 years since her parents passed away, 
We also learn that she isn't fond of shiitake mushrooms, but Kuroi has been cutting them up and putting them in her food for a long time, so she's actually eaten a ton of them. Finally, we learn that she doesn't get to go out much, so she's at her happiest when she gets to be with her friends at school, which explains why she wanted to go so bad in the episode. At the end of the next chapter in the manga, we get a character page about Kuroi. It states that she's 31 years old, and because she looks young, she's often asked if she's a student. She comes from a long line of aides to the Star Plasma vessels, but in defiance of her family, she left for a junior college. Despite this, she gave up her plans to enter the civilian workforce and came back to be an aide because of her fondness for Rico. Finally, we learn that she plays with Rico a lot at home and is really good at Mario Kart. In this episode, we also learned that this Fushiguro man, whose first name we still haven't been told, is indeed Megumi's father, although apparently he doesn't even remember his own son's name. We know from episode 23 that he apparently planned to use Megumi as a trump card against the Zenin clan, so it seems strange that he wouldn't even remember his son's name if he went so far as to have a plan for him. Either way, it's obvious that he's both devious enough to devise a plan to wear down Gojo, knowing how powerful he is, while also being dumb or at least risk addicted enough to bet money on a race and lose. He also seems to have a bit of a legend attached to him just like Gojo, as the suited man refers to him as the Sorcerer Killer, which leads one to believe he's done this sort of thing before. Next, I want to address the reference to Hikaru Genji that was made when Gojo busted into the chapel to abscond with Hiriko. Just a trigger warning here, this will be talking about grooming. The name Hikaru Genji references an important historical Japanese literary work known as The Tale of Genji by the author Murasaki Shikibu. There's a well-known element of this story, often referred to as the Hikaru Genji plan, which refers to an aspect of the story where Genji kidnapped a young girl from a life of poverty with plans to marry her once she became of age. This was referenced in the scene because of the age gap between the teacher and Gojo. Finally, I want to talk about Gojo's technique, as we finally get a bit of an explanation as to how it works in this episode. Gojo explains that his technique is based around the convergence of an infinite series of numbers, and likens it to the paradox of Achilles and the tortoise. Achilles and the tortoise is a well-known paradox thought up by Zeno of Alea, or Zeno of Alea, some, I, don't, I don't know, it's Greek. A Greek philosopher who lived from circa 495 BC to circa 430 BC. The circa means we aren't sure when he was born or died because of how long ago this guy lived. Basically, the paradox is conveyed via a story between Achilles, a Greek legend known for his speed, and a tortoise, an animal so renowned for its lack of speed it's been used in stories and fables for hundreds of years as the symbol of slowness. Basically, the tortoise fools Achilles into believing he couldn't win a race with it by dividing the race into smaller and smaller pieces and telling Achilles he could never finish the race because he'd always just be trying to catch up to the next, even smaller segment of the race. In my opinion, the only thing this story does is show that Achilles is a monumental idiot for not just telling the tortoise there's no reason why he'd keep stopping every time he caught up to it. But it's a well-known paradox that operates on the same principle as Gojo's technique. Basically, that the infinity technique works to stop attacks by infinitely slowing down the object in tiny increments until it appears as though it's stopped. He further explains that by amplifying the technique, he can manifest impossible things into reality, like natural negative numbers, which aren't a thing. Natural numbers by definition do not include negative numbers, since you can't have a negative amount of an actual tangible thing. Checkmate banks looks like my debt to use just imaginary. This is why Gojo also uses the example of negative one apples, a common item used to help teach children to count. Effectively, by amplifying his technique, he can use curse technique amplification blue, and this forceful creation of an impossibility creates a gap in reality that the surrounding reality rushes in to fill, causing what appears to be a magnetic effect that sucks things together. Gojo mentions that he can't create a large attraction field like that close to himself, but doesn't clarify if that's actually a limitation of the technique and therefore completely impossible, or if it's just a safety rule he abides by to avoid falling victim to his own technique. We also see him attempt to use Curse Technique Reversal Red, which we have seen him use all the way back in Episode 7, but this time he fails, showing that at this point in time, he has yet to master its use. In the manga, at the end of Chapter 69, 
We get a page from Akutami addressing Gojo's technique, which he had done before and decided he didn't want to have to address anymore, but like a bad rash, he just keeps coming back, which kind of showcases how he's playing fast and loose with math to try and make the limitless technique make sense. This shows how it can kind of backfire when you attempt to explain things like this in too much detail, but Gojo's technique is so cool, I don't even care if it doesn't actually make sense. Neither does Superman flying or Iron Man surviving getting blown out of the sky, but those are just as badass, so I think most people let it slide for the sake of the fun factor. It does go to show, though, the kinds of things that creators obsess over and stress about when they're writing. Anyway, that's my episode recap and story analysis for the second episode with the new season of Jujutsu Kaisen. Make sure to subscribe and turn on bell notifications if you want to be here as soon as possible each week as I put out new videos for each episode as it airs. And feel free to drop a comment with suggestions as to other videos you might like to see such as character analysis or explanations. Thanks for watching.